your Bible, if you would, to the book of Genesis, chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, and we will read together the first 14 verses. Genesis 22, beginning at verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the, the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place of which the Lord had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand, and a knife, and they went, both of them, together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. As you can see from the outline that you have been provided, the title of the message today is Jehovah Jireh, Provision Seen on the Mount of the Lord. I'd like to consider with you this afternoon four topics, but first, just briefly by way of introduction, I believe this passage before us is a well-known account, and yet we need to be reminded that it is really a privilege to consider this private account between Abraham and Isaac and the Lord on Mount Moriah. It's a privilege if mankind would consider it that God has even spoken. And it's a blessing that God's words have been recorded for us in the scriptures. And you are blessed to have a copy of God's word being held in your hands. And you have a further blessing when you read in the pages of God's Word these very private dealings, these special 
cases, if you will, not that we elevate one portion of God's word above another, but God has given to us this small window to look through to see this incredibly special dealing that he had with the patriarch Abraham. As Abraham and Isaac go to this Mount Moriah, as the scene unfolds just between these two and God himself. God ordered these events to reveal several things about himself, several things about his plan of redemption, several things about Abraham, and everything was orchestrated by a sovereign God. The timing after these things, after the bondwoman and her son, Hagar and Ishmael, were cast out. This unexpected command of the Lord to offer up Isaac. The explicit instruction that Isaac was to become a burnt offering. The fact that these two, father and son, went, the scripture says, together. The Hebrew word is in agreement. Isaac knew his fate on Mount Moriah as they went together. Abraham, as you know, was over a hundred years old. Isaac was probably 30. Isaac could have ran away, but these two went in agreement. They traveled three days from Beersheba, 30 miles northward in difficult terrain past Mount Carmel, past Mount Hebron, each of which is significant in its own right, to Mount Moriah, that place where God directed them. The building of the altar, the laying on of the wood, binding Isaac, putting Isaac on that altar. Abraham's belief system, whereby he was able to go through and carry out to that very point where he reaches for the knife. The sudden intervention of the angel, the substitutionary sacrifice, the naming of that place. All these things blend together, rec reflecting this, this nature or this character of God, that he is in fact Jehovah Jireh. I want to say two things by way of introduction. First of all, the meaning of this name. Jehovah Jireh simply means the Lord will see and the Lord will provide. Actually, this name, these two ideas go together. The Lord sees beforehand, and the Lord provides accordingly. Jehovah sees, and He provides. He sees beforehand. He sees the need before it arises. And Abraham has such God-centered thoughts that, as you know, he does not name this place the place of Abraham's pinnacle of faith, the place where Abraham passes the test. But he names it immediately to reflect that nature of God, which he has come to see once again, God provides. In the mount of the Lord it is seen, he is Jehovah Jireh. Secondly, I'd like to say something else about this name. Simply this, you need to appreciate this name in its biblical context. The name Jehovah Jireh has fallen on hard times. Its usage has been diluted, has diluted its meaning because 
it seems as though we only use it to describe outward things. Daily bread, personal circumstances where we conclude God must help us. The temporary, though necessary things of this life. And when we use it in that sense, this name loses its grandeur, its majestic meaning, its preeminence, its transcendent thought. Think of the context when God is named Jehovah Jireh. God will provide the Lamb. There is a, a deeper thought, a more special meaning, simply than God will provide all of our needs, which He will. And thank God that we can cast all of our anxiety and all of our cares upon Him. He does care for us. The psalmist said, He's never seen the righteous begging bread. Paul said, My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Jesus told his disciples who were faltering sometimes, he said, your father feeds the ravens, he clothes the lilies. He's aware when one sparrow falls to the ground, he will take care of you. Your heavenly father knows you have need of all these things. But dear friends, on Mount Moriah, God is pointing to your deepest need, your most desperate need, your most pervasive need. God sees a need that has a bearing on your life that will be reflected in eternity. God sees a need that you cannot supply yourself. God sees a need that only He can supply. God sees a need that you were oblivious to. As cataclysmic of a proportion as that need is and was, you were not even aware of it. What was it that God provided for Abraham? What was it that God provides for us? Nothing less than the highest provision that He can make. The Lord will provide. The Lord provides what? The Lord will provide Himself a lamb, a lamb for the burnt offering, which He commanded, He will supply. That is the utmost significance of this name, Jehovah Jireh. Well, now consider with me, if you will, these four themes or topics that this passage suggests. Number one, on Mount Moriah, we understand the necessity of worship. On Mount Moriah, we understand the necessity of worship. Notice, if you will, again, verse 2 and verse 5. In verse 2 we read, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And then, in verse 6, Abraham said to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. The burnt offering, which is mentioned six times in our verses, and the fact that he states to his servants that they are going there to worship, that is to prostrate themselves before Jehovah God, point us to the fact, to the necessity of worship. I don't know if you are impressed with this whole concept, and, and Brother Walter certainly spoke to it briefly in the scripture reading, but that the concept and necessity of God's people involved with worship. It's as though God is telling Abraham, 
Abraham, though you are the father of the faithful, though you are a patriarch, though you have enjoyed special privileges already as I have discoursed with you and shown you prophetic things and given you promises, Abraham, you must worship me. God is a great God. God is majestically enthroned on high. God made and sustains all things. God is sovereign, for of Him and through Him and to Him are all things. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is omnipresent. There is no other God besides Him. And He deserves worship. He can command worship. He deserves worship. Not as though he needs any other thing to make him complete. Again, from Psalm 46. Be still. Be quiet. Remove all excuses. Remove all hindrances from your mind. And know that he is God. He will be what? He will be exalted among the heathen, among the nations. What about the church? Will he be exalted here? Will he be lifted up in your thoughts, in your mind, in your heart? Oh, let us come and bow down and worship and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. God tested or tried Abraham under the principle of worship. We normally think of worship in the context of public worship or corporate worship. But we could overlay Abraham's situation here upon our own and ask ourselves, is there any way we can reason or excuse our way out of a commitment to worship? Commitment? What about desire? What about love? Is gasoline too expensive? Is the traffic too bad to drive to the hot building to worship? Do we have pragmatic excuses? Is one day in seven too much? Are the sermons too long? Is the building too hot? Are the brethren too invasive? But again, in this account, this is what I would categorize as private worship. And it's interesting to me, when you survey Abraham's life, you understand that he was well acquainted with private worship. Abraham is always found building altars. By the way, it's an interesting study. Study the altars that Abraham built. Abraham is always meditating upon God's work and God himself, and he responds with thanksgiving and exclamations of adoration and awe. Abraham is rehearsing God's truth in his mind and his heart. Abraham is bowing down and praying to God. Abraham is always found in the secret place. Abraham is a worshiper of God. Are you? Again, when you take these two thoughts together, the idea of a burnt offering and the mentioning of going to worship, we understand, despite the proportion of what has now been set before Abraham, he is going to worship. Let's speak for a minute to the idea of a burnt offering. Under the Old Testament dispensation in the book of Leviticus, there are five primary offerings that God's people were to bring before Jehovah God. Each for a specific person purpose, the burnt offering, the meat offering, 
the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. Each of these primary five offerings had specific differences or characteristics about them, all which pointed to some aspect of redemption that Christ would fulfill. For example, the, mer the, the, the meat offering and the burnt offering were put, were, were put on the altar, and these offerings did not have sin in view, but they had acceptance or blessing in view. The sin offering, the trespass offering, were offered on the ground, outside the camp. Those had in view sin, defilement, penalty for sin. Isaac was designated to be a burnt offering. His was to be a sweet-smelling savor in contrast to the sin offering. The burnt offering considers Christ not that particular aspect that he is the sin bearer, though he is, but it was considering Christ as mankind perfected in him, meeting God in holiness to worship, to be a blessing to God. Hebrews 5, excuse me, Ephesians 5 says, Christ has loved us and He's given himself to us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. The burnt offering was to be pleasing to God. It was to be something that satisfied him. The smoke of that offering was to ascend, as it were, into the heavenly place and satisfy God forever and ever. Of those five offerings that are mentioned in Leviticus, which is the first one mentioned? It is that one which has to do with worship. It is the burnt offering. That sweet savor, that offering of a life, wholly consumed upon the altar, in other words, a completeness of the act, it speaks of acceptance. This offering that Abraham is confronted with of his son highlights and with symbolical and pointing to an acceptable worship and God's satisfaction. Even on Mount Moriah, worship of Jehovah God is necessary. The patriarch Abraham is not excused from worship. First and foremost, when God comes into your view, worship. First and foremost, when trials and tests come into our way, worship. First and foremost, when God gives to you some revelation of who He is and you realize it, worship. First and foremost, when you set out to do something for the Lord, worship. First and foremost, there is this necessity of worship due to Jehovah God. <clears throat> Certainly it would seem that a contradiction would arise in Abraham's mind. After all, isn't Isaac the son of promise? Didn't God say that it would be through Isaac that all the nations of the earth would be blessed? Through the seed, the desire of all nations would come. And yet Abraham understands somehow through the worship of God, when God's rightful place is again realized in the heart of man, that God will do right. His purposes, His promises 
will remain golden. As I mentioned, this is an account that I categorize as private worship. And we mentioned that Abraham was often found in private worship. Are we acquainted with private worship? Do our scripture readings and meditations and prayers redound to his glory and not just to our good? We're so intent upon gaining knowledge and understanding, we can read through the scriptures, perhaps understand, understand some truth and not give thanks to God for it. We can leave our requests on the altar, let them be known unto God, but not offer that component of adoration in our prayers. We can hum a Christian song or a hymn because we like the melody, because we like the tune, not because we are, as the scripture says, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. Our worship quotient should be very high. When the scripture says, give unto the Lord the glory that is due his name, bring an offering, come into his courts. His courts may be here, his courts most definitely are in heaven. The injunction of the psalmist, O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, fear before him all the earth. Worship became, I think, second nature to Abraham. As we mentioned, after this event, when Abraham designates this mountaintop as the place where God provides, he christens it by a name that does not remind others of himself, Abraham, or his trials, or his success but he proclaims God's deliverance. In that place, he ascribes all greatness to God himself. He knew, Psalm 115, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thine own name give, give glory for thy mercy and thy truth's sake. That is the essence of worship, is it not? And so before we pass on, we just have to simply ask the question, do we understand the necessity of worship? Do we understand that worship is never out of season? Do we understand what we worship and why we worship? And is private worship happening in Pleasanton and Fairfield and Oakland? and Tracy, and San Ramon, and Hayward, et cetera, et cetera. Second idea I'd like you to look at with me is this. On Mount Moriah, we witness the inestimable treasure of knowing God. On Mount Moriah, we understand this treasure of inestimable value of knowing God. Abraham's true knowledge of God surfaces in this passage. And his knowledge of God is profound. It is personal. It is something to admire and emulate. We already know from James that Abraham was called the friend of God. And as a friend with that kind of relationship, it wasn't simply that he had a theoretical or doctrinal or emotional or shallow or orthodox knowledge. He knew God. He thought about God and his ways often. He communed with God. He understood his entire personal history, 
from the vantage point of God was dealing with him. I reason this exceptional knowledge of God from at least two points. Number one, Abraham recognizes God's voice. Abraham recognizes God's voice. Think of it. Think of it. This voice comes to Abraham with a very dire, striking, impactful message. And Abraham immediately recognizes it as the voice of God. No small thing. God had spoken to Abraham several times earlier. Warnings, promises, prophecies, some things difficult. And each one of God's recorded words to Abraham are understood to be from God himself. Words that speak to Abraham in a myriad of situations. Revelations of who God is so magnificent, magnificent that we would think it would be like Paul saying when he was caught up to the third heaven. I, I can't even, it's unlawful for me to write about these things. God could speak to Abraham in the desert, in Ur of the Chaldees, at the tent door, in the midst of family strife. During times of doubt, times of blessing, in the desert. And Abraham is able to understand, this is my God. This is God speaking to me. Certainly, Abraham knew God. Secondly, his knowledge of God is brought out in verse 8, when... Abraham says, before the event even unfolds, he says, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Even before the event unfolds, he has this cognitive awareness of who God is. He is already familiar with God. God has already provided God has already seen many needs. God has provided. And even before the event unfolds, it's almost as if he has this knowledgeable premonition of what's going to happen because he knows God. He knows God's ways. Now certainly, faith is a component part of this statement as well. But a knowledge of who God is, what He is like, what He does, how He has revealed Himself to mankind, fuels His faith. On Mount Moriah, we witness this treasure, we cannot even put a price on it, of knowing God to the point that He can trust, that He can obey. Again, if you examine Abraham's history, he seems to be in the business of trying to know as much about God as he can. He meditates. He discourses with God. He evaluates God's perspective on the events that intersect his life. He sees God's providences. He worships. knows God. God has just commanded him to offer up his only son. And what does he know about God? He knows God will never leave him nor forsake him. He knows that whosoever believeth upon him will not be ashamed. He knows the thoughts that God has towards him. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Thoughts to give him an expected end. He knows that what God has promised, he was fully persuaded that God was able to perform it. 
He knows that God will even through this event reveal more about himself to Abraham. For Abraham was sent very specifically to Moriah. Moriah means Jehovah is my teacher. God's going to unfold even more things about himself. As you think about Abraham's life and how he put together all these things that we say is his knowledge of God, can you see, my friend, how it cannot simply be a static or theoretical knowledge of God? Rather, you must synthesize, you must blend your doctrinal, your experimental, your intellectual, your practical, your individual, your corporate knowledge of God, all of these synthesized together under the blessing of the Holy Spirit to know God. That you must get, it must be first hand, it cannot be by proxy or by association. It must be historical. By that I mean it's gotten over the period of your life. You cannot learn something today about the Lord and make a snap decision about what that means about God. It must be fresh, new every day. Again, certainly faith was a component. But I'm suggesting his knowledge of God was so thorough, such a center of his attention, that he could set out for three days to Mount Moriah. He could undergo this test of the most severest of proportions. His faith could be tested to the extreme dimensions. He was a friend of God. Could God say of you today, you are my friend. We live in a strange day today where sometimes religion, I'll use that word least, very loosely, but religion does not seem to care to be with God alone in a secret place where we derive, I think, the greatest blessing. We are afraid to be alone, uneasy with solitude. So many outside influences coming into our mind, whether it's social media, whether it's advertising, whether it's the radio waves, whether it's whatever, that if we were to separate, our, separate ourselves from all of that, we're uneasy, we're struck dumb. What if you had a friend who never called you on the phone, never crossed your threshold, never wanted to visit you, could go weeks, months, years, without a visit and think that you were still their friend. One quote, and I, I think it was William Plummer, the Puritan, came after the Puritans. I think it was William Plummer, I'm not entirely sure, but he said this, there is a strange wisdom and insight accounting even to almost prophetic anticipation which creeps into the simple heart that is knit closely to God. It's a strange wisdom, it's an insight, it's almost like a prophetic anticipation which creeps into the simple heart that is knit closely to God. But whether the result of our friendship with Him be such communication of such kinds of insights or no, we may be sure of this, that if we trust Him, if we love Him, if we are frank with Him, He will impart something of Himself to us. That knowledge of His love, that knowledge of who He is, that knowledge that is all we need. The simple heart knit to God. I think that goes closer than friendship, does it not? My, my wife is making a quilt 
and she is sewing all of these, they call them squares, together. And I recall once where she made a mistake, and she had to unknit a section. And there were so many threads that had knitted those two together that it was no small task to undo that thread. Is our heart knit to God's heart, if you will? God reciprocated this friendship to Abraham. He showed acts of kindness to him. He called him by his grace. He blessed him. He increased him. He favored him. He honored him. He distinguished him. If you are a friend of God, you will not go unnoticed by God. Obvious, right? As we proceed up Mount Moriah, can you understand this true experimental knowledge of God, how valuable it is? In John 15, Jesus told his disciples, I am no longer calling you servants. I'm calling you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Are you a friend of God? How is your knowledge quotient with God? Recall that prayer by the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1, that the Father of glory would give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, so that the eyes of your understanding could be opened, so that you would know, so that you would experience His exceeding greatness. Thirdly, on Mount Moriah, we see the essence of faith. On Mount Moriah, we see the essence of faith. Let me go very quickly on this point and very quickly mark out four points concerning faith. Number one, faith never stops being a gift of God. Faith never stops being the gift of God that God has given to you. This is the essence, this is the nature, this is the genesis of faith. God gives it. And although it is a gift of God, faith is exercised by the individual as its own. I mention this because I have heard some very wild interpretations about what Christian faith is. As though faith inaugurates in the heart of mankind, or as though faith is given to you as a seed, and then it is your business to make it what it will be at the end of your life. Divorced from God's help, strength, undergirding, or God's developing. When we consider the faith of Abraham, if I could put it that way, we should not immortalize, as it were, Abraham and his faith. We should trace the stream back to its origin and see it was God who gave, as he gives severally to every man as he will, this faith. It's God gifted. As such, there are characteristics about this faith that if we would be diligent, that if we would be faithful, that if we would understand what this faith is all about, the divine essence or nature of it, we would understand 
that God wants that faith to be used in our life as a tool, not for glory for ourselves, not to pass these so-called uh, uh, tests that mankind builds up. It should always redound to His glory. Faith never stops being the gift of God. Secondly, faith possesses three elements, an intellectual element, its ground or warrant is founded in God's Word, an emotional element, as cognition passes into conviction, and thirdly, a volitional or an active element. In other words, faith is put into practice. Faith propels us. Faith moves us to do things. Not perfectly, not completely. Sometimes we fail, sometimes we're misdirected. But faith without works is dead. Thirdly, there are three attributes or characteristics of faith that will always be present. True faith is marked by righteousness. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. Faith is always righteous. Unrighteous faith is an oxymoron, is it not? Faith is always obedient. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, went out to a place that he would receive for inheritance, even though he went out not knowing where he was going. A disobedient faith is an oxymoron, is it not? Faith perseveres. By faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Faith will always be marked out by these three. A righteousness, an obedience, and a perse perseverance. Abraham exhibited this kind of faith. It was living. It bubbled to the surface. It wasn't just intellectual. It wasn't blind. It wasn't emotional, it wasn't theoretical, it wasn't doctrinal. It was the gift of God that animated him, that gave life to his works, that moved him. And fourthly, faith is tested oftentimes for your benefit. What did you think about the statement in Genesis 22 where the angel stops Abraham and says, Abraham, stop. Now I know that you fear God. Doesn't God know all things? Didn't God know beforehand? Didn't God know that he never intended Isaac to be actually put to death? But... Abraham, I'm suggesting, did not know that. Now it does say in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham thought, as a matter of fact, that he could have offered, killed Isaac, but then he would receive him right back from the dead, whereby we receive him in a figure, that picture of the resurrection. But there had to be some little aspect of humanity, some little corner of Abraham's heart, were that sealed by the angel, Abraham, now I know. That was for Abraham's good. Is that not the way it is with us sometimes? When we are tested, when we are tried, and there's a little sliver of doubt, I wonder how far I can go in this thing. How far can I trust God? And then he reveals to us, you can pass the test. Because it's my faith that I gave you. It's my gift that I fuel. It's my faith that I keep living. On Mount Moriah, we see the essence of faith. Lastly, today, 
On Mount Moriah, we behold the, the greatest provision of all. The greatest provision of all is seen on Mount Moriah. God sees not as man sees. God sees a desperate need. A need that only He can supply. God sees this need. That He must reconcile man back to Himself. Man does not have the ability to reconcile himself back to God. He doesn't even have the desire. Jehovah Jireh sees the far-reaching implications of this need. He sees how mankind has fallen irreparably in the fall. And God indeed provides the Lamb for Himself, to make satisfaction for Himself. And John the Baptist tells us who that Lamb is. When John saw Jesus coming unto him, he pointed to him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. On Mount Moriah, we see the greatest provision of all, though through type and shadow, we see God's plan of redemption revealed. As we see Abraham not withholding his only son, Abraham and Isaac carrying the wood up the hill, as we see the very hill, Mount Moriah, that place that would later be the site of Solomon's temple, later be that place called Golgotha. As we see the sacrifice, as we see the receiving back from the dead, as it were, as Isaac is taken off of the altar, as we see that lamb and the substitutionary ram, and that declaration of the promise, though through type and shadow. Abraham was in, involved in this event that was so acute, so dramatic, so pointed, such a revelation of God given to him, that Jesus spoke of this revelation to the Pharisees when he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. Jesus was speaking of Mount Moriah. That's where Abraham saw Jesus' day. That's when God's plan of redemption was unfolded to him. And though Abraham was not permitted in to live in a time to actually see the Messiah walk this earth. Yet he had a prophetic view of him. God had spoken earlier to Abraham about the Messiah's advent, about his death. A death whereby the Messiah, as the sacrifice for the sins of men, would provide salvation. Abraham was glad. Abraham saw the promise. He saw what was represented. The father of the faithful rejoiced to see him afar off. He understood the manner of his coming, his doctrine, the design of his death. It is no mere forcing of Christian meaning upon the Bible stories of old. Rather, it is the discerning of that prophetic and spiritual element which God has impressed upon these stories of the past. The event, the crisis, the climax, God providing a lamb 
a ram Isaac's life preserved. Jehovah Jireh, your deepest need, a need that is impinging upon you from every angle and dimension. That greatest need that will last for all of eternity. That need of which at one time you were unaware of. That need of cataclysmic proportions. God saw beforehand and provided that need. And on Mount Moriah, this is the time, this is the place where that revelation of God is unfolded. And Abraham sees that zenith star, that plan of redemption. And he was glad. He rejoiced. All around Mount Moriah, while this event is happening, there is famine and death. There is parched earth. All around Mount Moriah, people are scurrying about to and fro to validate themselves, to make themselves feel important, to feather their own nests. All around Mount Moriah, religious services are occurring and conducted in earnest rote and ritual. All around Mount Moriah, people are unaware, disinterested, clueless as to what is happening on Mount Moriah. They don't know about the long and weary journey from home to this place. They don't know about the toilsome climb up to that altar that would be built. They don't know about the Father's heart breaking within him. They don't know. They are unaware. And here on Mount Moriah, in a single point of time, God is providing the need that will transcend time, fix the sin problem, provide redemption. All around today, people are scurrying about to and fro, ignorant of, uncaring about this great need that God has met in His Son. I wanted to mention something, I have to do it very briefly, but it's interesting that on Mount Moriah we begin to see if we had time, what is unfolded is a completely dimensional provision. You'll notice that the scripture says God would provide a lamb, but it was a ram that was caught in a thicket. Two different words in the Hebrew, two different ideas. The ram caught in the thickets, in the thorns. Where do thorns come from? They came from the curse. This ram was caught in this effect of, or this cause or result of the fall. When you look at the ram, God specifically designated the ram was to be offered to qualify a high priest. On Mount Moriah, it was just not the lamb, the propitiation for your sins that was provided. He was also providing your great high priest. Jesus Christ fulfills that office as well. At this very instant, reminding His Heavenly Father of not just Mount Moriah, but Mount Calvary where indeed and in fact and in history and time the Lamb of God was slain for the sins of the world. And he stands in God's holy temple reminding God 
that he laid down his life as a ransom for many. Taking upon himself the sin of the world, as we sang about. So that there would be many from every tribe, nation, kindred, tongue, race, age group, that would come to him. God provided. God saw your deepest need. And he clearly publishes this, he proclaims this, he uses people to remind you of it. This need to be reconciled unto God. The provision in Jesus Christ, trusting Him, believing Him, coming to know Him, asking, seeking, knocking. His sacrifice was put to some account. His sacrifice was efficacious for many. I trust today that though through a very postage stamp size window we've seen on Mount Moriah the necessity for worship. We've seen on Mount Moriah the inestimable treasure of knowing God. We've seen on Mount Moriah the essence of faith. And we've seen on Mount Moriah Jehovah Jireh God providing that greatest provision of all. Let's pray. Father, we bow in thy presence. We thank you for thy word which details for us as we have looked today these many themes and topics. Knowing as well that your word is unsearchable. It's deep. We cannot fathom all of it. But for those things that we have considered today, we pray that your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, would impress the wheat upon our heart. Drive the chaff away, but might the wheat be impressed upon our hearts and our minds. Father, we thank you that you are in fact Jehovah Jireh. You saw our personal, deep, profound need. And as such, and as the only one who could provide, you did so out of love, with mercy, and according to your justice and righteousness. But who are we to be blessed in such a way? Oh, might that realization propel us to a quest for a deeper knowledge of you. Might it propel us to worship. Father, seal these words, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.